Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Budd from CPCAB. Recently I spoke with Dr Mick Cooper and Dr John Norcross about their book Personalising Psychotherapy. It was a real privilege to meet with them and I felt that it would be useful for both experienced counsellors and our CPCAB students at all stages. We had a great conversation which covered how to identify clients' preferences for their therapy and then how to integrate these preferences into the work. For our learners at CPCOB, if you're at level two or three, you might want to use this video to get a better understanding of agreeing with your helpie or your client about how the sessions will go, and also how to ensure that you're working within your limits. If you're at level four or above, you might want to use it to enhance your negotiated contracting and make sure that you're truly working in a user-centred way throughout the work. We really hope you enjoy the interview. We'd be interested to hear your thoughts about it in the comments. Thank you guys very, very much for being here today. Uh, we're going to um, go through some questions together and talk through kind of what you'd like to explain about the book. Um, so to begin with, um, John, the book proposes a new way of working with clients. I'm interested to understand how you came to the idea of personalised psychotherapy and what this then means for therapists and for clients. Well, it goes way back, Kelly. For at least 40 years, I've been working with Jim Prochaska and Carlo Di Clementi on the stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance, and how to match therapy in the relationship to a person's stage of change, known as stage matching. Um, then about 20 years ago, I have started conducting um, a series of meta-analytic um, studies on what is the best, most effective way to match, adapt, or tailor to the individual client. And it turns out matching to clients' preferences consistently emerges is one of the most powerful ways of meeting clients where they are. And then maybe just a decade or so, with American Psychological Association and some books we were doing, we started noticing the whole field was beginning to converge on this evidence-based practice that is bringing the best research evidence, clinicians' expertise, and the client, the client's expectations, preferences, and values together to form the best treatment. So personalization, simply, simply stated, uh, brings us a more effective, responsive, and ethical therapy. And the term personalizing itself, you ch looking through the book, you chose that for a very specific reason, because it kind of it, it explains the idea that it's very much about the individual client and not about a kind of broad scope of a diagnosis or something kind of more, um, more generic. Exactly so. It's a transdiagnostic, not a particular diagnostic category, condition, or disorder. Um, and in the research literature, you frequently find our humanistic and psychodynamic colleagues talking about responsiveness, our CBT colleagues talking more about treatment adaptation. But we've done some research here, as has Mick, that finds using the words individualizing and personalizing is immediately understood by our clients. It's much like personalized medicine. So as soon as you hear that, you know it's about the individual. And Every counselor knows how important this is. If you've ever been treated as a number, if you've ever been treated as someone, just take this, this is how we do it, you know how insulting and disempowering that feels. By contrast, personalizing is exactly the opposite. It's empower, empowering, individualized, choice, and that's why we intentionally use that term. Lovely, thank you, John. So kind of taking a step further, in the book you talk about different types of preference, kind of different categories. Could you say a little bit more about this? Yeah, so the in the literature, and uh, John was talking about the meta-analyses and, and looking across the different kind of studies on preferences, which is one form of personalization. So you have personalization and there's lots of different ways that can happen, but as John was saying, preferences, it, it seems to be a particularly powerful one. So what kind of preferences can clients have? Well, the first one is that they might have preferences for a particular kind of therapist. So they might want preferences for a female therapist or a black therapist or a lesbian therapist. So there's preferences about the therapist that clients might have. 
And then the second one is preferences around the particular treatment model, particular model of therapy. So that might be that clients come in and that they want something person centered or psychodynamic or um, CBT. And that that's at the kind of macro level. And then at the more micro level, we have preferences around the therapeutic activities. Uh, so that's what actually goes on in therapy. And so clients may not have the kind of macro level. They might not have strong macro level preferences, but they may say, well, you know, I'd like to, I'd like a therapist who's going to listen to me and I really just want to be able to get things off my chest. Or they might say they want techniques and methods. So when we're looking at activity preferences, we're, we're looking more at the micro level of what goes on in the therapy uh, and what the particular methods are particularly uh, that are used, but it could also include things like kind of contract issues. It could include things like the kind of format of the therapies, group or individual, uh, depending on what, what what's available. Um, I guess you've also got that you've also got kind of preferences which are about if you think about going through the process of therapy. So somebody might come in for therapy, and then there's what we might call between treatment preferences, which is what they choose at the kind of level of the therapy as a whole, and then you've got the more within therapy preferences and the between therapy preferences are more those preferences around the therapist because you're not likely to change the therapist during therapy and also the model but then you've got the the within treatment within therapy preferences which are more about what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis with a different client uh where, where clients might have particular preferences at that level so it really ranges from the kind of macro right down to the micro okay and the sort of activities might be what particular things that the therapist does or particular things about the way the therapist is with the client in the sessions? Yeah, it could be. I mean, so it could be about the therapist activities. Mm -hmm. So it could be, for instance, I want a therapist who's going to suggest homework. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be I want a therapist who's going to take more of a lead in therapy or less of a lead, somebody who's going to be more challenging or less challenging. So it could be in that sense also about the kind of style of the therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, it could be about the client's activities. It might be, you know, I would like this a space where I can get things off my chest. Mm -hmm. I would like this to be a space where I can look at my childhood. Uh, I would like this to be a space where I can learn about different ways of coping with my anxiety. And as you say, Kelly, it might also be relational preferences. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like us to have a kind of to work very collaborat collaboratively together, mm -hmm. or I would just like the therapist to get on with it. So it can it can span those three levels really. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, John, a moment ago, you spoke a little bit about the, the kind of evidence background for this. Could you tell us a bit more about the research evidence for for this personalised approach and how, how it links into improving engagement, improving outcomes? You bet. Um, there's now at least 60 or 70 randomised clinical trials on clients' preferences published in the English language. Uh, when we review those through the through meta-analyses, we find that accommodating client strong preferences modestly increase the effectiveness of counseling or psychotherapy for all patients. Um, but more than that, if you assess and accommodate clients' preferences, you decrease the probability of dropout by almost 50%. So that's a huge impact. Um, there's probably three mechanisms uh, or reasons why accommodating preferences translate into better success. Uh, the first is that we know simply assessing preferences enhances the therapeutic alliance, that warm bond, the agreement uh, on who's supposed to do what so even before you wonder if you should accommodate that strong preference, simply asking someone, what would you like? Not the goals, not the where do you want to get, but how you want to get there demonstrably improves that bond uh, between client and counselor. Secondly, if you've ever been given a choice, you know how wonderful that can feel. So just asking someone for a choice. Do you want A or B? Would you care for this or that? Um, immediately uh, helps the relationship and it also helps the task, the goals that you're working for. And finally, 
The third potential mechanism of why this works is the actual match. So if someone says, as Mick gave the example, you know, I don't like homework. I feel like I'm in school when someone does that to me. Well, then actually implementing that strong client preference, matching it, helps them use the therapy better. So if we're all just a little more humble and recognize the power of individual differences, assessing and then accommodating preferences when it makes sense enhances the therapeutic alliance. It increases that sense and empowerment of choice and the actual match probably helps clients use their time better with you. That's quite an impressive success rate in comparison to the kind of research landscape as a whole. And over the last 50 years, our attempts to genuinely make therapy more effective. This particular piece of research really does show a kind of significant success rate in comparison to, to what we've been doing for many, many years. Yes, hands down, uh, using these transdiagnostic characteristics to shape and tailor therapy to the individuality of the client is way more powerful than treatment A versus treatment B versus treatment C for a particular disorder. By the way, that's no longer my personal opinion or clinical lore. That's just established fact. The effect sizes, of preferences, stage matching, cultural adaptations, all of these are way more powerful. Such a kind of freeing thing to hear when we've been kind of entrenched in my modality is better than your modality for so many years to actually think that we can take something that kind of sits outside of that and really does have a genuine impact on the client's experience and their ability to stay with the therapy and kind of feel involved in it. Indeed, um, and as pluralistic or integrative therapists, that's exactly why the Mick and I feel so empowered by this our, ourselves. This is easily, along with the stages of change and you know my work on the therapeutic relationship, uh, the most powerful things we are um, grappling with in psychotherapy. It's, it's not the particular treatment. You know, as I tell my students, about 80% of your training is going to be learning a particular therapy or counseling method. And sure, we need to do that. We have to do something and it should certainly be research supported. You want to make a profound difference? Then be matching to the entire person, whole person counseling. And that is the preferences, their culture, their needs, uh, the therapeutic relationship. That's that's where the power and magic of therapy is. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I think one of the reasons for that and that difference is because in our trainings we we learn to see therapy from a very therapist centered viewpoint, and our focus is on modalities, and we think about person centered and CBT and psychodynamic as all these different things, but. Clients don't see it like that. They don't see, oh, that's a bit of CBT and that's a bit of person sense and that's psychodynamic. I mean, the research we've done with young people, for instance, shows that they say things like, well, I really valued being listened to. And I also really valued the advice that I got. They don't make those distinctions. They're much more concerned with things like feeling that the therapist was warm, uh, that the therapist kind of had a sense of what they were doing, developing trust. I mean, those are the qualities that really matter to clients. And so from a client's eye view, uh, these ad adaptations that we're talking about, I think are much more important. Uh, and, and to see it, for us as therapists to see it, we kind of need to get up from our chairs in a sense and see therapy from the other direction and what it might be like for a client to be part of this process. And that's precisely why, uh, Kelly, both Mick and I think it's instrumental that counselors and therapists undergo their own personal work. Uh, when you're in personal therapy, a lot of this treatment method technique -y stuff kind of just moves to the background. Yes, it's important. That's, that's part of the effect of what we do. Um, but it's first and foremost a personal relationship. So when we get rid of some of this therapist centricity and return to the personhood of the client, all the stuff about adaptations uh, 
and treating the person as an individual takes center stage. Yeah. And anyone who's been in a good bout to psychotherapy knows that in their bones. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is a real importance in training for trainees to sit in the client chair, experience it from that side and ask themselves what truly was important for me in that setting, rather than only ever having learned it from a kind of academic perspective. Over these, I've never had a client say to me at the end of um, a kind of period of therapy, do you know what was really important to me? That you really understood your theoretical underpinning. That's not where clients come from. <laughs> like you, say, it's about, you were warm. You have really felt like you accepted me for who I was. You you asked me what I wanted and what I needed. Like so kind of even opening up that question at the beginning puts that person in control. And it's not an illusion of control, it's a genuine control. So when we're talking about kind of opening up and beginning to ask that question of a client, that kind of leads us into talking about the uh, the CNIP, the Cooper Norcross Inventory and Preferences. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how you see that being used and kind of how people might kind of make use of that in their practice? Yeah, so the CNIP is a form. It's, it's, it takes about maybe five minutes or so to complete. And the idea is it's a, it's a kind of structured way of finding out from clients about the kind of style of therapy that they'd like. And we, we, we developed it that it could be used by therapists of any orientation uh, to, to give to their clients and to begin a discussion, really. And, of course, the discussion is the important bit about the particular way of working that they'd like their therapist. To, that ideally, they'd like their therapist to be adopting. So there's four <clears throat> main dimensions on it. One is whether they want... A therapist who's going to take more of a lead or let them take more of a lead there's a dimension around do they want the therapist to encourage more emotional intensity or to allow the therapy to have less of an emotional focus uh, there's a past or present dimension do they want the therapy to focus on their past or would they like it to focus uh, more on the present and future and then there's something around do they want a therapist who's more warmly supportive or more challenging in a in a in a kind of focused way and then there's some additional questions on it around for instance preferences around gender or modality um so we we it, it's a tool you know it's the beginning of a dialogue and and the the the, the scales allow the therapist to see whether the client has any strong preferences along those particular di dimensions and just to say i mean i think both john and i feel that st the st strong preference here is, is a key feature that we're not you know somebody might have a bit of a preference for this or a bit of a preference for that but it's where it's strong preferences that as therapists we we it's important that we know and that strong preference is both for what they might like but also and perhaps even more so strong preferences for what they might not like. So if you've got a client, for instance, saying that I really don't like silences, they make me really uncomfortable, then that's something that therapists need to know about. And we think it's important that therapists find out. They say, you know, if a client feels well, sometimes I feel a little bit uncomfortable with silences, then your clients are often very flexible. Um, but where there's a strong preference for something or, or for some, not for something, then that's useful information. And the scene, it begins a discussion so we can see what clients like. Clients from our data so far suggest that clients actually quite like completing it because it helps them clarify and communicate what it is that they want. We would probably use it assessment, maybe further down the line. It's something that can be used in supervision. Uh, it, it, I, that's where, one of the places I find it most useful, actually, as a supervisor, because a, a, a supervisee might be thinking, well, I wonder if I should be more challenging with a client here, or I wonder if it's useful to go into their past. And that's where bringing out the form, having a look, seeing what the client said can be a useful guide to how it might be helpful to work. And of course, it's not that the, the client completes it and like it's a kind of menu where they tick off what they want and then we do that. But it's about having that dialogue and we may have ideas. We may, you know, there may be times when a client says that they want something and actually we don't think that's helpful. And that's something that we can discuss with them. So it's not just going off and doing it, but it, it's facilitating a dialogue and inviting a client to talk about something that they may not feel that they are able to talk about. And that, that's one of the feedback we've had clients saying that, you know, I've been in therapy before and nobody, nobody's ever asked me 
what it was that I wanted. And it was, it was nice to be asked. Some of those clients say things like, well, you know, I didn't really know. And that's fine. And, 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 you know, that's not a point to be labored. If a client says, I don't really know what I want, then, then it's not something we would, you know, spend a lot of time and say, come on, you got to know, you know, you move on. Um, but it's opening up that space for dialogue and, and, and to be able to have those conversations. And is it something that you would go back to with a client over the kind of course of therapy? So you might check in with them again, see if their preferences have changed, particularly maybe if it's their first time. Yeah. So in in our um, in our service, in our clinic, we use it at the beginning and then we use it maybe session four for review and session 10 for review. Um, and then sometimes clients' preferences change. There's quite a lot of um, consistency, actually. So, for instance, we find that clients who at the beginning want to um, focus on on uh, want more of a therapist-led approach, they don't tend to kind of massively shift to the other side. I mean, sometimes people who want to talk about their past at the beginning then think, actually, now I'd like to talk about the present. But generally, they're, they're fairly consistent. But it is very useful as a way of kind of having further dialogue with the client about what it is that they want now to go back and use that at review. Sure. And um, if, say, it's the first time if a therapist is watching this and they've not heard or they've seen it before, what would be your advice of how they might might access it, might begin to use it in their practice? Yeah, so to say it's freely available, uh, you don't need permission to use it. Uh, if you go to uh, cnip.net, that's c-nip-nip.net, then you can see all the instructions for using it. You can download it. There's a digital uh, platform that clients can complete it on so everything would be there and it's been translated now into about 10 different languages as well so international colleagues can also use it fantastic so what sort of practical advice would you offer to a therapist when beginning to establish a client's preferences well as mick has emphasized it's to do so you don't need to use the cnip we developed that for both clinical and research purposes but it's to open this dialogue um, where you are enhancing the alliance, you are helping the client become a co-creator of their own therapy. Um, and you introduce or frame uh, the assessment of preferences um, in a strong, confident voice. Uh, some of our students and trainees have made this early mistake they sort of ask clients, well, how do you think therapy should go? And naturally, patients are surprised and, and say, well, don't you know how to do therapy? So as you introduce this, start just start with a simple prep. Uh, you know, mine goes something like, I've been conducting psychotherapy and psychotherapy research for 40 years now. If I've learned anything, it's that I like to tailor or personalize therapy to you. So let's have a brief discussion about what you think will work best for you. And we do so after establishing the patient's goals. So then I would add, in order to reduce your depression or decrease your problematic drinking or to help you become more aware of why you act like you do. So preferences are about the how. Um, most therapists have lots of training in establishing treatment goals, uh, the where, but they rarely ask, you know yourself better than me right now. I've just known you for 30 minutes. How do you think we can use our time best? And so you ask from a position of confidence, knowing that your clinical experience and the research evidence strongly support you trying to tower it toward them. As the MIC has also emphasized, um, you just need a couple here. This process should be a few moments. Um, we think this can be easily done in three or four minutes. You want to walk away with some strong do's. This is what they strongly value. And a couple don'ts. Uh, like we were discussing, Mick and I, what we would really dislike in therapy. Um, long silences and a bunch of standard interpretations would just annoy the hell out of me. Um, other people love therapist self-disclosure. Others despise self-disclosure. So it's all about meeting them where they are, doing it reliably, 
walking away, making a note, and then as Mick has uh, discussed, checking back with them. How am I doing in that regard? Because we all have our sort of de facto baseline way of interacting with patients. If we're not careful, we'll behaviorally drift back into just doing what we typically do rather than making the extra effort to individualize or personalize it. So just building on what John's saying, I think another uh, very helpful way into asking clients about their preferences is asking about previous therapies. A lot of the clients that we work with will have had therapies before, will have been in therapy before or had something similar to it. And so asking them about what they found helpful and not helpful when they saw someone before can be a really useful way of just kind of getting a sense of what might be most likely to work for them uh, or not work for them. And one of the things we found in our research is where um, clients haven't had previous therapy or haven't had previous experiences of talking through problems, they're probably less likely to have strong preferences. I think the strong preferences often emerge because people have had experiences of this thing and then they kind of get a sense of what they like and what they don't like. So if a client says, well, I haven't been in therapy before and this is my first time in therapy, it's possible that they'll have less to say about preferences and it may mean that it's an even briefer conversation. But I think as John was emphasizing, the important point is keeping it natural, keeping it relaxed, not making a big formal thing about, you know, now you must tell me your preferences, just in a, in a naturally inquisitive way. I want to help you as much as possible. Do you have any sense of how I can do that? I think that that message for particularly for trainees of do it with confidence and make and be natural with it I think is really important I see a lot of times students are very scared like you said John of asking that question in case the client turns around and says well you're the therapist don't you know what you should be doing that they or that the client might ask for something that they can't provide and that by opening that door suddenly then they have to meet whatever is asked for and I think there's a real kind of caution around um, almost kind of not wanting to lead the client down that route but when thinking about it if you don't ask you actually are leading the client down a route because you you don't know and you can't do anything about it if you don't know yeah so on that point Kelly if we can spend a little bit of time on that Accommodating and working with client preferences is absolutely not about being all things to everyone. Uh, and it's absolutely not about going beyond our proficiencies and our competencies. We all have trainings, we have trainings in particular approaches, and it's really important that we work within the boundaries of what we are trained in. Um, so it's not about, say, being a person-centered therapist and the client says that they want CBT and then we try out some CBT. Um, it's really about, it's, beginning a dialogue where we can explore what the client wants and what we're able and trained to provide uh, within that. And it may be that what a client asks for is not something that we can provide um, and that we need to look at alternatives. But I think as you're saying there, Kelly, the important bit is that that discussion is held because even though it might there might be some anxiety about that, it's much better to have that discussion when a client is saying, look, I really want advice and guidance. And we're able to explain that actually as person-centered therapists, for instance, that's not what we're trained to do. And then we can look at what we do that rather than going weeks and weeks into the therapy where the client is sitting there waiting for the advice and the guidance and the psychoeducation to come. And there's never actually that dialogue about the fact that that's not what we've been trained to provide. Yeah. Yeah. I think that for me is reading through the book. That was what hit home is the important thing is asking the question so that you you know and the client feels that you're at least interested and then if you can do it then you can if you can't then you've got that opportunity to talk to a client about that sure. and that means that therapists really need to reflect i mean in the book one of the things we talk about is the importance of therapists reflecting on what it is that they feel able to do and and having an awareness of that and being specific about that so rather than just I'm a counsellor or a therapist and I can do anything. Actually, what can I do? Well, I can uh, really listen well to people. I can help people develop insight maybe and understand more about their experiences. Uh, what, I can't, what can't I do? I can't give people the answers. I can't make people happy. 
understanding that and recognizing that is really the first step to be able to assess and accommodate preferences because it tells us about our own scope of practice. And I guess that, that then kind of opens the question of how, how does a therapist begin to accommodate these preferences or very clearly not accommodate the preferences if it's something that they genuinely can't provide? So if a client does express a preference, there's, there's really four choices that we have four ways that we can go with that. So one is that, you know, the, the, the best one and the, the, the great one is where a client says, I have a preference for something, you know, I have a preference for really having space just to talk about things, get things off my chest. And that's exactly what we can do. You know, we feel skilled and we feel competent in that. We recognize also that it's going to be helpful for that particular client, or we feel that we can understand the kind of rationale for why that might be helpful. Maybe we're aware that there's good evidence base for that practice so that we can accommodate that um, and work with a client along the lines of that preference. Now, a second possibility is that a client um, suggests something which we kind of think would be helpful, but we also maybe have some other ideas about it um, or feel that maybe a slightly different version of what they're asking for would be useful for them. For instance, maybe a client talks about really wanting a space to talk and we feel that would be useful, but we also think it'd be useful to maybe understand a bit more about their childhood. So what we talk about in the book is about adapting and offering adaptive preferences um, and discussing that. And of course, it's something that we decide with the client, but it's not simply going with the client. It's some adaptation of what it is that they are looking for that we believe maybe based on the evidence based on our own experience would be most of value going further along that spectrum then there's there's an alternative which is where maybe a client is asking for something that for ethical reasons uh for practical reasons for maybe on, on the basis of the evidence that we really don't think is helpful uh, probably going to be less likely and, and it's not something ideally we'd want to do. But for instance, if I'm working with a client, say I'm working with a client who's talking about uh, that th their problems are that their relationships break down and that they're always very compliant. They're always doing what other people tell them to do. And we talk about preferences and they say, well, what I'd really like is for you to take a lead in the therapy and I'll just kind of sit and respond to you. That might be in a situation which I'm thinking, you know, I, that's really sounds like that's going to be colluding and just compounding that problematic way of relating. And that might be an example where I'd say, look, I think what I can do most helpful in the therapy here is, is something different, which is maybe help you to look at ways that you can take uh, some, some, some control uh, and, and some initiative. And, and, you know, again, I can't impose that on a client, but I would be proposing that alternative and maybe working with that alternative that the client may or may not agree with, and we would have that dialogue. And then the fourth option is another, which is where actually what a client is wanting, we recognize the validity of that, and we recognize that that's, that could be very useful for them, but we also know that that's not something that we are skilled or able or wanting to provide. And if that's the case, then it may be referral on to another. Um, referral on to another, we need to be cautious about that. Clients can experience that as a kind of rejection if we say, look, I'm, I just can't work with that, um, even though we may not mean it in that way. So we need to be careful. And I think there's some good evidence that trying to kind of find alternatives or adaptations is generally a good idea, particularly if you're working in a service, for instance, where clients don't get much choice. But I think being open to the possibility that we do need to refer that client on to uh, another person is, is important to always have in the back of our mind. And John was talking about training earlier, and I think it's a shame that we often get very little training on onward referral and how in a very supportive, collaborative, uh, positive way to help a client find the therapist that's going to be able to help them more than we can. And in that way, Mick, we place the client's welfare above our own immediate comfort. None of us like to admit, I can't do that, I don't do that, we're not a good fit. So instead, we relentlessly try to keep patients who will be served uh, better elsewhere. Um, that's the ethic. The ethical imperative is to find the best match. And that's really what accommodating preference is, comes down to, to me. What is the best ethical probability that you'll 
uh, experience the happiness and health you seek from counseling or psychotherapy. Yeah, it feels there's a real kind of tangible sense there of if the client's preferences match what you would naturally offer, perfect. If the client's preferences are something you can adapt to and accommodate, then that is about bending your practice to, to meet the client's needs. But beyond that, what you need to be aware of is not bending the client to meet your needs or holding on to them when actually you know truly that it's a it's a wrong fit, but referring on in a sensitive way that makes them feel that you're doing that for their best interest, not in a rejecting way. Yeah, and, and also, you know, it's a nice word, bending. It's a good word. And also not bending yourself out of shape. Yeah. It's really important as practitioners, we, we don't feel that we just, we have to be anything that a client wants. Mm -hmm. Having a, John was talking earlier about confidence and having a sense of, a clear confident sense of what we can offer is just so important and, and what we can't offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of my um, early clinical supervisors, the late Arnold Lazarus of multimodal fame, used to say, the best therapists are authentic chameleons. We can shade this way, we can shade that way, but we can't do plaid. So move patients on where they can do better. Yeah. I guess know thyself and thy limitations. Don't think because a client wants you to do this suddenly, yeah, I can probably swing a bit of CBT. I read a book about it five years ago. It's kind of really genuinely understanding what you as a practitioner can do and the extent of that and where that ends. Cool. Okay. But thinking about kind of trainees and students, one of um, one of the things I'm aware of that we do as an awarding body is we ask our students to establish a client's expectations for therapy. And in the book, you make a very interesting distinction between an expectation and a preference. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? You bet. So expectations are literally what your clients expect to happen, whether they like it or not. And it's interesting, we've trained so many people, so many years to assess expectations. When it turns out, um, that relationship to success is quite modest. By contrast, assessing um, and perhaps accommodating their preferences has a much stronger effect now in dozens upon dozens of research studies. So I, I think you're going to see, Kelly, a shift toward more emphasis on what do you prefer? It may not be what you expect. And they're not mutually exclusive, of course. It may be worth asking what they expect, but it's surely much more curative, empowering, alliance building to ask about preferences. Um, and you know, it, this doesn't take much time. I, I, I think we should probably emphasize that. Even if you do the CNIP, it'll take three or four minutes. If you ask verbally for a couple strong preferences for what they want or what they don't want, we're talking about adding only three or four minutes um, and you have this probable impact on making the alliance stronger, of improving their success and decreasing dropout by almost half. So let's move from expectations to preferences. Or if you have the time, by all means, do both. Yeah, I think there's a real, um, a really powerful difference between the two. And I'm instantly thinking we need to change some of our criteria um, to add this in. Because for me, kind of expectations, it almost feels like a passive voice. What do you expect me to do to you? What do you expect to happen to you? Whereas asking the question, what do you want? What do you prefer? Um, really kind of, th that's an offer rather than a, what do you expect? Oh, I expect this to be terrible and I expect therapy to, or I expect therapy to wave a magic wand and repair my life. The broader transformation mm. from a biomedical perspective yeah. to a client empowered or whole person approach. The expectation is, you know, how bad do you think the side effects are going to be? The, the preference is, look, you're a knowledgeable adult who obviously knows yourself. You know what's worked in the past. You know from previous therapists, friends, life, what's likely to work. Let's benefit from that as a genuine collaborator in this enterprise. It, it leads to a whole different feel. The next one we've kind of 
started to speak about this a little bit, about what if as a therapist I I disagree with what the client wants, what they feel is beneficial to them, or what if they want something we can't give. Do you want to do a little more on that? Sure. Um, Just because a client asks for it doesn't mean they get it. Uh, There's ethical concerns. There can be your best clinical judgment. We've addressed the realistic limits of scope of practice. And sometimes, honestly, you're going to think it's not in the patient's best interest. Mm. But by opening this dialogue, um, you together create an understanding of what can and cannot be accomplished. Mm. I have every reason to believe that accounts for part of the power or the effect of accommodating preferences. Is mix uh, addressed? Um, We have four primary choices. We call them the four A's. You can adopt, you can adapt, you can do a mild alternative or just refer to another service or person. Um, You know, I sometimes, when I'm doing workshops on this, I like everyone to reflect on the last three times they personally have seen a healthcare professional. You know, their primary care physician, their physical therapist, their kids, pediatricians, OBGYNs, chiropractors, whatever. And I asked them, just think about those last three visits. Were you asked for an important preference or choice about your treatment? Mm. Only 10% of our workshop participants raised their hand in affirmation. It's usually, this is how I do it, sit down, receive the treatment and walk away. So even when we can't provide exactly what the client may strongly prefer, they know they're treated respectfully, collaboratively, and here's a person putting my needs above their own schedule, their own default. Um, And that's part of the power of accommodation. I kind of, as you're saying that, I think what what occurred to me was when I was kind of reading through the section and hearing what you're saying now, is I was thinking back to my own original very um, Rogerian person-centered training, which obviously has a real kind of onus on the therapist that's not the expert, the client is the expert in themselves, and yet at the same time there was a real kind of sense of the underpinning belief is that. You should not direct the client. You should not give advice. You should not guide. And yet if a client came to me and said, what I really want, my preference really is for you to be quite confrontational, to be really engaging, um, to be giving me advice, guidance, being directive. um, The little person centre part of my brain would kind of instantly kick in and say, but I don't believe that's what's good for you. And yet I want to be client centred. But deep down, I believe possibly I am the expert because I, what you're saying you want isn't what I think you should want. And there's a real irony in that for me that I think is quite, um, it's quite entertaining internally. Yeah, but also an important, and it's an important paradox, really. And uh, it, it needs attention. I mean, person-centered therapy, and I say this as someone who's been in the person-centered world for years, It's fantastic when a client says, what I want is space to talk and I want to lead the way myself. Being person-centered is fantastic. But exactly as you say, Kelly, what happens when you have a client who says, I want the therapy, I want you as the therapist to lead the way. And the reality, and this surprised me, I mean, it really surprised me. It wasn't particularly what I wanted to see, but what we've seen our research again and again and again is that that is what the majority of clients want. They want structure. They want guidance, they want advice, they want somebody who's going to kind of input in quite a leading way. And it's not that clients just kind of throw up their hands in horror and say, look, I don't know what to do here, you've got to lead it. But clients say things like, well, you know, I want to make the most of this time and you've been through training, you've got expertise, I'd like to learn from you. Um, so I think it's really important to listen to that. And, and it, it is ironic that uh, an approach that if you hold a very non-directive position, 
when a client is saying that they want some direction and they want some guidance. The irony is that you, in a sense, are holding a therapist expert stance and you're saying, well, you know, you might think that's what you want, but actually I know that really what you need is non-directivity and then you'll develop an internalized locus of evaluation and then, you know, that, that that's the best way for you. So I think this is, for me, a lot of preference work, like pluralistic therapy that I've been involved in developing. It's kind of person centered but at a meta level. It's about being person-centered about therapy as a whole and recognizing that there are differences in clients and trusting clients, not, not just believing that there is some kind of hidden inner core within the client that knows things, even if the client themselves there at that time doesn't know that, but trusting the person sitting in front of us, as John was saying, that they're an intelligent, thoughtful person who's doing the best to address their problems and that what they say and how they express things might not be the, the final word on anything, but is something that it's very important that we take seriously and that we engage with rather than coming from a stance of, at the end of the day, I know better than you what you need. Yeah. Uh, I think that that sense of trusting that what the person really is drawn towards, that what they feel they want is that is the important thing. Go with that if you can as a practitioner. Well, I, I wouldn't say go with that, Kelly, but I'd say engage with that. Okay. You know, I think it's not about, you know, when, because when we talk about trusting the client, there's a real question about, you know, what level are we talking about? Are we talking about what they say consciously? Are we talking about trusting their inner felt sense? You know, because those things might be different. And I think we would say that trust is about engaging at all those levels. It's not, it's not just doing what a client immediately says, because clients often do say, and we know from our research, they say, I don't know what I want. I don't know what's going to help me. That, that certainly comes up quite a lot. Um, and, 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 you know, that's legitimate. And it may take some time for the client to understand what they want. But it's about engaging and trusting both what the client says there at the time and also what might emerge as the therapy unfolds. Exactly so, Mick. Uh, that's why, Kelly, we prefer the term shared decision making. Um, you're not just saying, well, the client always knows best because they have no expertise and many of them don't have experience, but nor is it for the counselor to immediately assume they know best, uh, particularly if they practice from a single theoretical tradition and like the procrustean bed imposing it upon everyone but it's the shared decision-making, right? And that's literally what evidence-based practice means, by the way. You, you take research and the clinician and the patient, you bring them together, and it's at that intersection or that confluence of collaboration that the magic happens. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's not the, the client singly guiding it, the therapist singly guiding it, it's about bringing that that discussion that engagement with preferences into the relationship and allowing the collaboration to really kind of guide where it goes you mentioned that as well what about if the client doesn't know what they prefer or i i can imagine having a client sat in front of me that says well i I don't trust that what i want is what i should have so you tell me what's best for me i i really don't know So supposing I'm working with a client, I might say something like, do you have any sense of what might be helpful for you here? And a client says, I really don't know. So the first thing I probably do is find a different way of asking that. Like, um, you know, in, in your in your past, has there been things in maybe therapy, if they haven't had therapy, maybe in friendships that you found helpful for you? Uh, and a client might say, well, it was helpful when, you know, my friends really listened to me or accept me. Or again, they might say, no, I just don't know. At that point, I think I'd be inclined to move on. I, I really wouldn't want to milk it and say, you know, you've got to have some preferences here. It, it, it risks being coming across as then judgmental and kind of over controlling and expecting too much of the client. So I think if a client was pretty adamantly saying, I don't know, then I, I would get on and do what I was trained in and maybe say, well, look, the way that I've been trained to work is this and this, and why don't we give that a go and see how it goes? And then we can review four weeks down the line, 
uh, see whether that's working. As I was saying before, if clients haven't had experience of therapy, it may well be that they need some of experience of it before they can really say what it is that they like or what it is that they don't like. And we found, Kelly, that within four to five sessions, Virtually all clients who came in saying, I don't know my treatment preferences, they will then develop treatment preferences. They'll say, you know, I didn't particularly like that. I don't understand this. Um, and, and part of ascertaining that is by genuinely inviting them to share what they don't like. So many patients will defer or they've been socialized. If you don't have anything nice, don't say anything at all. As soon as you invite, invite them to, you know, in here, I want to know really what's going on. You're not going to hurt or offend me. In fact, you hurt both of us by not telling us what's working for you. Uh, virtually all clients within a few sessions will say, this has worked better than this, and maybe we do a little less of that. Mm. I guess by opening the the question at the beginning and saying, okay, so we'll, we'll kind of go with what I'm trained in, but you'll have a chance then to experience it. And the, the things that you don't like about it and things that you do like about it, I want you to then tell me so that we can, we can kind of bend it as we go along and kind of make it something that fits. But I do, I really like that idea of actually if the client genuinely doesn't know, don't kind of hammer the point home because eventually it becomes a, a judgment of, well, why don't you know what's what's wrong that you don't know what you prefer? So as soon as you get that kind of any form of resistance or sense of, no, I really don't have have a preference here, ease off. Okay. Um, okay, so my, my devil's advocate question is... If I'm a therapist and I've been trained in my my one kind of niche approach, I know what I do, I like what I do, and that's what I believe would be a useful therapeutic relationship for my client. Finding out preferences, adapting, potentially having many clients in a day, all of whom want something slightly different, sounds quite tiring, quite exhausting. How... How as a therapist do you kind of manage potentially having to adapt every time for a client? And wouldn't it just be easier to do what you want and allow the client to just kind of like it or lump it? Well, that sounds to me, Kelly, like effective therapy. It's exactly what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, if people are coasting along, giving everyone their default one-size-fits-all therapy, uh, then they're not doing good therapy. As a matter of fact, unless you carefully select your patients, we know you are demonstrably not doing as good as therapy uh, as you can be. It really is that simple. And I ask such people to immediately reread the ethics portion for their own profession. Um, I'm pretty sure, I, I, I don't know your qualifications and standards, Kelly, but I am about 99% certain it doesn't begin with do what you feel most comfortable with and impose those preferences onto every patient you encounter. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure that's not there. Instead, it begins with beneficents. We are here for our clients' welfare. Mm -hmm. So it's not to make you comfortable. And like seeing your GP, you know, your general practitioner, um, Every day, they're probably seeing 20 patients with different disorders, disparate preferences, medications, no medications, hospitalizations, ointments, maybe no treatment other than some wise advice and warm support. We should be doing something different with each patient. So I don't mean to rant uh, at you. You're just playing devil's advocate. And what Mick and I are encouraging is maybe three to four minutes of assessing preferences in an opening session or maybe session two or three. Um, if you're already assessing your patient's treatment goals, it's quite easy to add a few more moments of asking, how do I get to those treatment goals? And if you're not shaping yourself to each patient, um, 
then I'm quite concerned um, about your effectiveness. And that's what the research clearly shows. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I sometimes ask my uh, trainees, my residences, I'll say, now imagine to continue with our medical model here, you went to a physician who treated everyone the same. So patient one co comes in with a brain tumor, patient two comes in with an infection, patient three comes in with depression, patient four comes in with how do I take care of my aging parent? And you gave them the identical treatment, say an antibiotic for each one. What do you think about such a person? <laughs> and they say, well, a quack, they should lose their license. And I say, now imagine you see a psychotherapist who gives every single patient CBT, homework, structure, just gives them the same thing. What do we call that person? Uh, Well-trained? No. <laughs> yeah. No, Kelly. Brilliant. That is exactly the rant that I want. <laughs> I mean, just to add, just a bit, add to what John's saying, uh, when you were talking about kind of getting exhausted, Kelly, and burnout, um, in my experience, from what I know where burnout happens, it's, it's generally because people are doing the same thing again and again and again, because they get tired and they get bored and there's little stimulation. We found in research that we did, uh, when we asked clients about how much they did shared decision-making, that actually we found the correlation between how much shared decision making there was and how satisfied the counselors were with their practice. Mm. Because they, and I imagine that's because that there was a variety, there was a, a genuine engagement with the clients, there was an involvement that was above and beyond. I can't think of anything worse than doing the same thing over and over and over again, uh, you know, eight hours a day. If Certainly for me, it's, it's, it's not about doing everything. It's not about you know, doing a whole range of things, but, but having some scope and in, engaging, uh, is that, is that engagement, dare I say, a relational depth, mm -hmm. which is about tailoring to that individual person that is the lifeblood of therapy, certainly for me, and I think uh, is, is what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. I've loved it, just in my own practice, since I've become more pluralistic, more interested in dialogue with my clients about what they want, I've certainly found that I'm much more engaged, alive, or, or awake in that work than I was when I first came out of training and was, was much more consist, kind of static in, in how I was working. Yeah. I think, I think the kind of the message that I'm hearing particularly is a sense of if a therapist has kind of got into a, a groove, a kind of an, easy going, just do the same thing. That's not, it's not going to be satisfying for the therapist. It's not going to be effective for the client and probably indicates that there really is something missing in that relationship somewhere. Whereas this really does invite therapists to every client that you meet, you meet them in their entirety. And this allows you really to kind of get, get in there with the client and really understand what they want rather than just provide the same formulaic therapy relationship. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I, I think that therapists, some therapists like doing something very similar each time, and I'm sure that works for some clients. I wouldn't say there's a guarantee that it's not going to work, but I think certainly that um, on average, I think people feel more engaged where that there's some variety in the clients, certainly as John was saying, want some tailoring and that that's really not going to work. It's unlikely that tailoring is going to have negative effects, but doing the same thing, the procrustean bed, is certainly going to harm some clients. Okay, brilliant. So so we've heard from both of you around the the new book and kind of really had a good look at how, how on a very practical level therapists can look at client preferences and how that kind of fits within personalised in psychotherapy as a whole. So if somebody's watching this video, how would somebody now learn a little bit more about it? How are they going to find more resources and kind of be able to bring this into their work? So if people are interested in the CNIP, the uh, website is cnip.net, c-nip.net. 
and you can find out more information about the measure there. Uh, the book's available, Personalizing Psychotherapy, that you can get uh, Amazon and all good bookshops. If you're, I, my website is mick-cooper.co.uk and people, there's a page there about pluralistic therapy, which is a lot of information on personalizing and working with client preferences. And John, your website is? Just search for John C. Norcross at the University of Scranton. And there you'll see our work on preferences as well as therapy relationships that work. The second volume of which has all the meta-analyses on which methods of adaptation or personalizing work best. So Kelly, thank you for the opportunity and the wonderful questions and even serving as a fierce devil's advocate. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Great to talk to you. Great to talk to you too. Thank you very much for coming in and spending some time with us today. It's been a privilege. Thank you.